Let's continue our session on RF and millimeter wave power amplifiers. We covered power amplifier design and its various aspects from millimeter wave to RF frequencies <clears throat> in the morning session. We looked at a new power amplifier design that is becoming very popular, digitally intensive power amplifiers, leveraging the, leveraging the code devices uh, and nanometer CMOS technology that is becoming very popular these days. And now for the last presentation of this session, let's look at another popular technique, envelope cracking, which is used for enhancement of efficiency of power amplifiers. Our speaker today will be Dr. Johanna Yan. Dr. Johanna Yan is a lead engineer at Maxcentric Technologies, LLC. Dr. Yan heads the RF power amplifier, Earth Systems, and Applied EM Group, and is responsible for the development of broadband high-efficiency power amplifiers, envelope cracking supply modulators, compact ER modules, and digital signal processing for various applications, including software-defined radios, radar, electronic warfare, multi-band carrier, and wideband commercial applications. Dr. Yan received her BS, MS, and PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of California, San Diego. Thank you very much, Dr. Yan, for joining us today. And she will be presenting in envelope cracking for 5G and millimeter wave power amplifiers. In this presentation, we will focus on a particular power amplifier architecture, the envelope tracking power amplifier. In modern communication, the need to be spectrally efficient while achieving high data rates has driven the use of higher order modulation signals, such as the LTEA signal shown here. The plot on the top right shows the probability distribution function. As one can see, the resulting signal exhibits significant amplitude modulation. It is not uncommon to see peak to average ratio powers of 7 dB or greater. This presents a critical problem for power efficiency. The challenge is further complicated by the increasing channel bandwidth. The outline of the presentation is as follows. We will begin with a crash course on envelope tracking power amplifiers. After that, we will look at various analog envelope modulator circuits. Then we will look at some test beds for envelope tracking measurements, followed by some results. The next topic we will talk about pertains to multi-carrier 5G signals for envelope tracking. And then we will talk about digital envelope modulator circuits and summarize our talk. Shown in this chart are power amplifier architectures for high efficiency in the presence of high PAPR signal. Some examples include the Doherty amplifier and the outphasing amplifier, as well as the envelope tracking power amplifier. The envelope tracking technique is a baseband technique, and hence depending on the design of the power amplifier final stage, it can offer high average efficiency broad carrier bandwidths, and as well as high efficiency over a wide average backoff range. This is achieved by replacing a static supply with a dynamic varying supply. In conventional power amplifiers, a fixed supply voltage is provided to the PA. When excited by signals with high PAPR, this results in low efficiency, which translates to high power consumption and heat dissipation, as shown here in red. By contrast, in envelope tracking, the power amplifier is supplied by a modulated supply voltage that tracks the envelope of the RF signal. This results in high efficiency, lower power consumption, and lower heat dissipation which translates to lower junction temperature and potentially higher reliability. The envelope tracking power amplifier consists of the envelope modulator and the RFPA. 
by providing a modulated supply that corresponds to the envelope of the RF signal, the RFPA can be kept close to its saturation where the efficiency is highest. To calculate the envelope tracking power amplifier's efficiency, we need to account for the power dissipation in both the envelope modulator and the RFPA. The envelope tracking efficiency is the product of the two. Hence, to achieve high efficiency, it is necessary that both the supply modulator and the RFPA shows high efficiency. Shown here are the family of curves for the efficiency and gain of a RF amplifier for varying supply voltage as a function of output power. A particular relationship between the supply voltage and the true envelope of the RF signal can be chosen to optimize for linearity, gain, output power, or efficiency. We call this the envelope shaping function or the detroughing function. The envelope supply is to trough to a particular voltage to prevent gain collapse in the RFPA and also it helps minimize its sensitivity to time misalignment at lower voltages. To get an estimate of the RFPA performance under envelope tracking for a particular signal, we can look at its performance at that average voltage. For example, for a 5G waveform with 9 dB PAPR and a peak voltage of 28 volts and a minimum at 2.8 volts, the average envelope voltage is 11.7 volts. If we take a look at its performance at VDD equals 12 volts, we see that this PA, based on this family of curves, can achieve 72% drain efficiency, 16 dB of gain, and 50 watts of output power. Compared to the other advanced power amplifier architectures, like the Doherty, which rely on load modulation, the envelope tracking power amplifier remains on a constant R load. Here we show the load line of the power amplifier for a class B PA and an ETPA, as well as the efficiency as a function of output power. As you see, when the RFPA under envelope tracking moves across different supply voltages, it effectively looks like different sizes of class A, B, P, A put together. By driving the PA close to saturation as, a, as the supply voltage is varied, the efficiency is kept at a high efficiency at most times. To understand the effect of the on resistance and the need voltage of the RFPA on its efficiency, we can take a look at the efficiency degradation factor, defined as 1 over 1 plus gamma R on divided by R load. This can be approximated as 1 minus gamma R on divided by R load. Since the need voltage and the on resistance are related with each other, we can see that the efficiency is proportional to 1 minus V need divided by VDC. This tells us that for a peak efficiency, a low on resistance or a low knee voltage would help us achieve higher peak efficiency. To understand the effect of the device characteristics on the peak efficiency of the RFPA, we have to take a look at the on resistance, effective resistance, CDS, and delta CDS. Shown here in the table, we are looking at four different device technology, a GAN FET A, a GAN FET B, a silicon LD MOS part, and a gas HBT. As discussed before, the peak efficiency is related to the on resistance. The lower the on resistance, the higher the peak efficiency would be. If we take a look at the four technologies shown here, we can see that the gas high voltage HBT has the lowest on resistance. Hence, we expect that the gas HBT would have the highest peak efficiency. 
The effect of low resistance also plays a role in the peak efficiency. Comparing gallium nitride FET B and silicon LDMOS, we see that the on resistance is approximately the same. But the effect of low resistance is higher in GAN FET B. Hence, we expect GAN FET B to have a higher peak efficiency than that of the silicon LDMOS part. Shown here is a drain efficiency versus the ratio of the R on divided by the effective load resistance. Just as we had discussed in the previous slide, the high voltage HBT shows the best peak efficiency, followed by the GANFET B, silicon LDMOS, and then, again, and then the GANFET A. The drain to source capacitance of the FET also plays a significant role. This helps determine the variation between the average efficiency and the maximum efficiency. In this graph, the square shows the maximum efficiency, while the circle shows where the average efficiency was. For the gas high voltage HPT, the device exhibit a low on resistance and a low cap value. Hence, this resulted in the highest peak efficiency with the smallest difference between the max and the average. The gallium nitride FET B had low on resistance, slightly higher than that of the gas high voltage HPT, but similar variation in terms of the capacitance, and hence the variation between the average and the maximum was very similar to that of the HBT. On the other hand, the silicon LD MOS has a significantly larger drain to source capacitance. This resulted in a larger variation between the average efficiency and the maximum efficiency. Gallium nitride FET A had smaller gate width that translated to higher on resistance and hence lower maximum peak efficiency and a moderately diff uh, slightly higher drain to source capacitance as shown by the slightly larger variation compared to that of the HBT and the other GAN FET B. At this point, we will turn over to look at analog envelope modulator circuits. Shown here are four conventional envelope modulator architectures. The simplest form of an envelope modulator is that of a linear regulator, shown here on the top left corner. Since the linear topology has wide bandwidth and little output ripple, it achieves excellent in-band and out-of-band spectral performance. However, the power efficiency of the linear regulator is very low when the output voltage is low, which is the region where the PA operates more frequently. By contrast, the switching mode based modulator shown here on the top right corner has high efficiency across a broad range of output voltages. However, it produces high output ripples. Its bandwidth is also constrained to be a fraction of the switching frequency. In order to meet the stringent spectral performance required for modern communication systems, even higher switching frequency is needed to adequately suppress the switching ripple. This causes higher switching losses that severely degrade the efficiency. To overcome the disadvantages of these two architectures, a variety of hybrid architectures can be used. A hybrid amplifier can be constructed by connecting the linear amplifier and the switching amplifier either in parallel or in series.
To understand the advantages of using the parallel linear switcher envelope amplifier topology, we take a look at the envelope spectrum. The amplitude spectrum suggests that majority of the power is located in the DC and low frequency range. We call this region 1. To achieve high performance, this region should be covered by the switcher stage to maximize efficiency. The high frequency power should be provided by a high fidelity source, hence the linear stage, to achieve high linearity. Region 2 extends from a few hundred kilohertz to approximately the bandwidth of the signal. This region is a critical region in order to produce the envelope supply with high fidelity. The performance of this region is dominated by the large signal behavior of the linear stage. Region 3 is defined as the tail end of the envelope spectrum. This region is dominated by the small signal performance of the linear stage. Both region 2 and 3 are covered by the linear stage. Shown in this chart is the behavior model of the envelope amplifier as well as its signal generation. We extract the envelope by converting the IQ signal into the polar domain. The cresting can be done to reduce the peak to average power to further increase efficiency. The, the amplitude of the RF signal is fed into the envelope shaping function or detroughing to create the envelope signal for the modulator. The right side shows the analog model of the envelope modulator. The linear stage is modeled simply as a linear amplifier. Since the linear stage can sync and source current, the output of the switcher stage is used to determine the switching waveform and how much current to sync or source. A hysteretic feedback is used to determine how much power the switcher stage should provide. To ensure high efficiency performance, the linear stage current is minimized. The efficiency of the modulator can be evaluated by considering the loss mechanisms of the stages. In the linear stage, the power losses of the output stage is the summation of the loss from the sourcing FET and the sinking FET. Because the switching current has a slow varying amplitude compared to the output voltage waveform due to the large inductor, the switching current can be assumed to be constant. In the switcher stage, there are two main sources of power loss. Conduction loss, which mainly comes from the on resistance and the switching loss, which is dependent on the switching frequency and its parasitic capacitance. To minimize the conduction loss, wider device width is needed. However, at the same time, the switching losses would be increased due to the larger parasitic capacitance for larger device widths. For wide bandwidth signals, higher switching frequency is also required, which could lead to more losses. This is part of the design trade-offs to be considered to achieve high overall efficiency. We will now look at examples of integrated envelope amplifier. Here we see a high power envelope modulator designed for 5 to 8 watts of output power. This was designed in a 0.18 micron by CMOS DMOS process. The four main circuit blocks in this design include the linear amplifier, the switching amplifier, the transimpedance amplifier, and the comparator. The large inductor at the output of the switching stage is placed off chip. 
The circuit diagram of the envelope modulator shown in the previous slide is shown here. In the linear stage, a operational transconductance amplifier is used at the input stage. In the current sense stage, a current sensor and a transimpedance amplifier are used to sense the current and convert it to a voltage for the hysteretic comparator. A single current sensing scheme is used to minimize die area and power consumption in the comparators. In this manner, the delay between the output of the linear stage and the control input to the switcher stage can be minimized. In this chart, we show an example of a series switcher linear with a parallel linear switcher envelope modulator designed in a 0.15 micron CMOS process. The supply voltage was 4.5 volts. Compared to the conventional parallel linear switcher topology, a second switcher is added to the linear stage to increase the efficiency of the linear stage. This topology requires two envelope input signals. The standard input envelope signal goes into the linear stage while a bandwidth reduced version of that envelope goes into the second switching stage. In effect, this is basically envelope tracking the linear stage to provide better efficiency. If we take a look at the plots on the bottom right hand corner, we see that the that for a 10 megahertz envelope fed through the standard parallel linear switcher stage and a 1 megahertz bandwidth reduced envelope that tracks the envelope of the envelope is fed into the second switcher stage. In this slide we show a closed loop parallel linear with dual switcher integrated modulator. The idea here is that we have two switcher stages, one that covers the low frequency region one that we talked about, and the second one that covers part of that region two to increase the efficiency of the modulator. The first low frequency switcher stage is driven by a hysteretic feedback. On the, for the second switcher stage, a dead band switching scheme is used to make sure that there's no overlap between the two switcher stages. Measured results show an average efficiency of 77.5% for a 20 MHz LTE signal with 6.6 dB PAPR. This was fabricated using the 0.18 micron CMOS process. In addition to the envelope modulators shown in the previous slides from publications, there are also commercially available integrated envelope amplifiers. Shown here are some examples of the commercially available envelope amplifiers 
whose performance ranges from for modulation bandwidths of from 10 megahertz up to 40 megahertz for higher power amplifiers. As you see, since the efficiency of the envelope tracking power amplifier depends on the efficiency of both the modulator and the RFPA, it is essential that the modulator exhibits high efficiency, and hence um, power efficiencies from the modulator about 70% is what's needed, if not higher. We will now look at test beds for envelope tracking measurements. Shown here is an example of an envelope tracking test bed that can operate between 2 GHz and 86 GHz depending on the LO signal from the up converter and the down converter. This test bed was designed to operate for EER, ET, polar, and linear mode. A FPGA platform is used for signal processing for both the digital pre-distortion and envelope shaping. The envelope signal is generated digitally and sent to the envelope amplifier. The IF signal goes through a hybrid and then some balance into the up converter for image rejection. At the output of the RFPA, our DUT, a feedback signal is fed back to the FPGA platform for digital predistortion. Here we show another example of an envelope tracking test bed. This includes the arbitrary waveform generation as well as the DSP. The FPGA platform is based on the Altera Stratex 5 with tunable, uh, with, and the test bed has a tunable RF bandwidth of 500 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. A third ADC is used to provide system in the loop solution to sample in and stream in a signal. Programmable LOs are used to enable reconfigurable operation and tunability. One of the benefits of envelope tracking and is that it's, it is a baseband technique and with digital pre-distortion, which is also a baseband technique, the two of them couple with each other very well. Here I show another example of a measurement setup for envelope tracking done at X-band. In this setup, the In this setup, the signal was generated out of a Textronics arbitrary waveform generator, and the feedback circuit was a uh, feedback signal was measured through the Infinium scope. The two equipment are synchronized um, with the re same reference clock. As you can see in all three setups, the envelope signal is generated in the digital domain. One of the advantages of generating the signal in the digital domain is that the time alignment between the envelope path and the RF path can be done digitally. This simplifies the, um, the setup quite a bit. It also provides better accuracy in terms of the time alignment between the two paths. For higher frequencies like millimeter waves, a two-stage up conversion is used. You up convert to AIF, and then and then you up convert to millimeter wave. The idea of a two-stage up conversion to a second IF is used to reject the image. In order to make the RFPA with a envelope modulator, a few changes need to be made. Shown here on the left is a constant drain RF amplifier. As you can see, large decoupling caps are located on the drain line. 
To put the RFPA into envelope tracking mode, you have to remove these large decoupling capacitors and replace it with the modulator. On the decoup on the on the drain line, you'll need to also add a RC snubber. Remember not to remove the necessary RF capacitors. Here I show some measure results at X band with a SSPA operated at 10 gigahertz. The peak envelope voltage was at 15.6 volts. Using a 100 megahertz 16 qualm LTE signal with 6.6 dB PAPR, the Envelope tracking PA outputted about 5 watts of output power. The overall gain was about 12 dB. The, o the RFP efficiency was measured to be about 77%, and the envelope amplifier efficiency was around 71%. So the product of the two came, uh, came out to be about overall about 55% efficiency. The figure on the top left shows the envelope amplifier that was used and the figure on the uh, on the top right shows the setup of the envelope modulator connected to this RFPA. Now I will talk about envelope tracking for multi-carrier applications. Multi-carrier signals across a wide bandwidth presents challenges to the envelope modulator. Here I show the spectrum, the envelope spectrum of a four carrier signal. Each carrier has 20 megahertz of bandwidth. Uh, there are and the two, uh, the two pairs of carriers are spaced about 500 megahertz apart. Similar to how I previously was talking about region one, region two, region three, we'll take a look at these different regions. We, as you can see, region one, where the low fr frequency and DC component lie is relatively about the same. This is taken care of by the switcher stage. However, we take a re look at region number two, due to the fact that there are multi, multi um, these are multi-carrier signals, we see a second um, bump at around 490 megahertz. The large signal performance of the linear stage extends to about 40 dB dynamic range of the envelope signal. And as you can see, this is approximately 490 megahertz of large signal bandwidth is needed for this particular signal for traditional envelope tracking. This presents itself with challenges in terms of high slew rate requirements. In addition, region number th region three, which is the small which dominates the small signal performance of the linear stage extends to about 75 dB dynamic range of the envelope signal, which is approximately three to five times the signal bandwidth. That's where that number that you usually hear from hear about that three to five times the signal bandwidth requirement on the envelope modulator comes from. And that extends to way beyond one gigahertz. The signal requirements for both the large signal performance and the small signal performance presents incredible challenges to analog modulators. Just for comparison, I, t I show right here the, um, the envelope modulator performance of a particular analog modulator. We see that the large signal bandwidth is approximately 40 megahertz and the small signal bandwidth is approximately 200 megahertz. And hence, for this particular signal, under traditional envelope tracking, this is beyond the abilities of this modulator. So one of the questions was, what is it that one can do? Shown on top is the traditional envelope tracking scheme, where the envelope signal tracks 
entirely to tracks completely with the um with the RF signal. The idea of a adaptive slow envelope is that we generate an envelope signal that varies slowly, but has lower bandwidth requirements and slew rate requirements, while still being closely knit with the envelope sig the envelope of the RF signal. The criteria for the slow envelope is that we need to be still equal than or great equal to or greater than the original envelope to prevent any clipping of the RF output. At the same time, to maintain high efficiency operation, the slow envelope and um, the difference between the slow envelope and the original envelope should be minimized. Here I show the spectrum of the slow envelope. As you can see, the slow envelope has much slower slew rate the, the large signal bandwidth has been reduced from 490 megahertz to 44 megahertz. This is region number two. And the small signal bandwidth was reduced from greater than one gigahertz to 315 megahertz, which is acceptable uh, for the modulator, for an existing modulator. This technique can be done in the DSP domain while still keeping the hardware the same. So what is the trade-off between using such a technique? To understand that, we take a look at the effects on the RFP efficiency. Shown in this graph, we see that with a slow envelope, there is a difference between the slow envelope versus the original envelope, the envelope of the RF signal. And this difference here is seen as the efficiency degradation. So we define K to be the efficiency degradation factor. For simplicity, we will take a look at the equations for a class B amplifier. Using the same signal I've described in previous charts, we can calculate that calculate K, the efficiency degradation factor, to be about 0.88%. 0.88. We can estimate this slow, if it, uh, slow envelope ET efficiency uh, by taking the efficiency of the envelope amplifier assumed to be sim similar to that of, a, of the signal of a signal with the same bandwidth and multiply that with the RFP efficiency using across the same band. From calculations, we see that if a modulator is capable of doing this one, this extremely wide bandwidth of one gigahertz, one the ideal efficiency would be approximately 49%. But using the envelope the slow envelope technique a, with an efficiency degradation factor of 0.88, the resulting efficiency would be approximately 43%. The benefit of using this is we can realize this with existing hardware, while in the traditional envelope tracking case, you would have to design a modulator that could support 1 gigahertz of bandwidth. Another important factor to look at is the linearity and how linearization for envelope tracking is affected with this slow envelope technique. In conventional envelope tracking, the envelope supply voltage has a one-to-one -one relationship with the, actual, with the RF input signal. This relationship is the envelope shaping function we mentioned before. Here I show a graph of the output power versus the input voltage and supply voltage. In envelope tracking, with this one-to-one -one relationship, the PA traverses through a single trajectory. and hence a one-dimensional lookup table 
or one a one dimensional um, polynomial is sufficient for linearization. However, when we take a look at linearization for slow envelope, this, the situation is different. The VDD is no longer a solely a function of the current RF input, and hence, in, hence the ETPA model traverses over a surface. This causes the linearity to appear like a memory effect as a result of operating across different gain curves. This spread is different than the traditional memory that we're used to for RFPA that has to do with past outputs. Instead, this is a self-induced spread that's not truly a memory effect and can be dealt with with multi-dimension lookup tables or VDD-based polynomials. Linearization for the slow envelope-based envelope tracking can be done with a combination of different algorithms. A multi-trajectory surface-based memoryless correction can be used for RF power amplifiers with little memory, in which the spread is due to mostly this self-induced memory. So this memory model is a function of the envelope signal VDD and the RF input. For this simplified mo for this simple model, a interpolation can be used to minimize resource uh, usage. In addition, the envelope path can also be linearized to to enhance the envelope amplifier linearity and push the envelope bandwidth a little further. The benefit of using a envelope path linearization scheme is that it also addresses the interaction between the RFPA and the envelope amplifier. In the event that your amplifier does have a lot of mem have s sufficient memory effects, um, a memory memory effect compensation can be done added to if you were to add a th uh, s another dimension for the VDD signal into a memory polynomial. So now I'll show some measured results done at the CBRS band uh, for a five for the five G signal um, using a four carrier waveform. As you can see, if then if the envelope tracking PA is designed properly, before and after linearization you should be obtaining about the same amount of output power and efficiency and with and the only difference should be just better linearity. So here these these results are based on a Cree uh, based Cree um, RFPA with a modulator redesigned. The overall efficiency was about 43%. The RFP efficiency was around 72% and the EA efficiency was around 60%. In this case, we were pushing the, um, the limitations of this particular modulator and hence the slightly reduced efficiency. The total output power is about 10 watts. Here I show the corresponding linearity in, in depicted in the AM to AM and AM to PM and spectrum. As you can see, the linearization with just a memoryless model accounting for this self-induced um, spread using um, using the VDD voltage as a, the second input to this model, we were able to go from 22% EVM to 1% EVM after linearization. 
and the ACPR improved by more than 25 uh, dB to achieve better than minus 50 dBc ACPR. So these are some really great results for a multi-carrier amplification for 5G applications. Now I'm going to move over to talk about something different, the digital envelope modulator circuits. To understand the motivation to designing a digital envelope amplifier, we take a look at a conventional envelope amplifier. This is an analog envelope amplifier. The figure here shows the block diagram of an analog, analog um, envelope amplifier. The amplifier has two analog closed loop feedbacks, which is simple and works well for fairly narrow lower band signals. Um, and we showed in the previous section how to overcome it for moderately wider band multi-carrier signals. Now if we want to have instantaneous Y-band signals um, with, these, with the increasing signal bandwidth that's needed in next generation systems, we encounter a lot of challenges with analog envelope amplifiers. And the three main challenges are one, time lag. So the time lag um, in the current sense stage to for the for controlling the switcher stage can no longer be neglected. Secondly, uh, with with wider bandwidths, we will need a higher switching rate um, in the switcher, and this will cause large power losses. And thirdly, um, the uh, analog input is simple, but it's also less less flexible. And so, with these three factors combined. Uh, what we end up seeing is a huge efficiency degradation in the envelope amplifiers for wideband signals. To overcome these challenges, a multi-switcher digital envelope amplifier can be designed. Using multiple switchers with multi-phase inputs in an open loop operation, the delay at the switcher can be overcome and it would not affect the efficiency. Also, by using multi-switchers, the effective sampling rate increases without incurring higher DC power losses. And finally, with a digital input, flexible. Here I show a comparison between a dig between the results of a digital envelope modulator and a analog envelope modulator in a, in simulation. The signal we're using here is a 3G LTE signal with 20 megahertz PAPR of 7.5 dB. In this simulation, the digital envelope amplifier consists of four gallium nitride switchers. As you can see, using the four multi-phase controls to drive the switchers, the envelope signal tracks out of the switcher tracks very closely with the envelope signal. This is done without increasing the switching frequency of each switcher, thereby keeping the losses to a minimum. In simulation, we find that the efficiency can be up at around 89% compared to the 65% in the analog conventional envelope amplifier, where the switcher operates in a much slower uh, switching rate. The simulation results show that the digital envelope amplifier is a very promising architecture for over for applications in which one wants to achieve over 100 megahertz spin. In this chart, chart the the details of the multi-phase control is explained. 
The light blue curve is the expected waveform and the dots are the sampling points. Here the sampling rate is defined as Fs. When the single switcher is used, the switching rate is also Fs and the DC power consumption becomes large. When multi-switchers are used, the switchers are controlled alternatively and the switching rate decreases by 1 over n times slower even though the switching effective switching rate is still maintained to be fs hence the po dc power consumption is also reduced by a factor of n what are some of the challenges for designing a digital multi switcher envelope amplifier the biggest challenge is maintaining sig signal fidelity without using analog feedback. In the digital envelope amplifier, there are four causes of this possible distortion to the op output voltage. One is the nonlinear on resistance of the switcher. Two, the bandwidth limitation due to the output inductor. 3. The bandwidth limitation due to the snubber and the bypass cap. And 4. The nonlinear current of the RFPA. To overcome such distortion, envelope pre distortion can be used. We can separate this into a two step process 1. Coarse tuning. This is basically nonlinear preemphasis. This can be done in the digital domain using the equivalent circuit based model, and this will help with linearizing and pre distorting distortion caused by 1, 2, 3, and 4 from the previous slide without any feedback. The second step is fine tuning. This uses, uses a memory polynomial predistortion that is, a, that is based on a behavioral model and adaptive using a envelope feedback. The, the preemphasis in the fine tuning can be, pre, can be used to precalculate the input duty cycle using the RFPA model and, the, and other equivalent circuit equations such as the RC snubber model, the envelope current, and the input duty cycle. The switcher current of each switcher is defined as the envelope current divided by n number of switchers. The picture here shows the equivalent circuit model for the multi-switcher. And we can, using these equations, we can model the current out of each switcher, the summation of the current I envelope, as well as any current leaking into the RC snubber. Here we show the measurement results of a multi-switcher envelope amplifier. The results take into account the nonlinear preemphasis that we discussed in the previous slide, as well as the switcher on resistance. If we take a look at the plot on the left, we see that the EVM across the various power is kept very low to less than 1.5%. This is achieved with the preemphasis addressing challenges one, two, three, four, as well as adding in the fine tuning with a memory polynomial based model. The envelope amplifier is then put into envelope tracking with the RFPA. In this case, we are using the uh, RFMD 3931, and we see that the envelope tracking AM to AM, AM to PM looks fairly clean and linear after pre-distortion. The measure results showed 
overall, 38% efficiency. This accounts for the efficiency of both the modulator and the RFPA at about 5 watts of output power and less than 3% normal, normalized RMS error. In these measure results, the multi-switcher digital envelope amplifier exhibited 66% efficiency, outputting about 7.5 watts of average envelope power. Now we take a look at high-speed switchers. One of the reasons we like looking at gallium nitrite hams for high-power switches is that they have good on resistance and low off capacitance. One of the challenges to using standard gallium nitrite hemp switches is that they are depletion mode devices. So critical components are now the are the gate drivers and the dead band control in order to use these gallium nitrite hemp's. The loop inductance between the driver and the, fine, and, the, and the power FETs can cause losses and ringing. So it is very important that for the gates drivers that we look design them to have good propagation delay and good matching. And to do so, one way is to put them on the same package or to have same die integration. Other processes to as candidates could be silicon MOSFETs, enhancement mode gallium nitrite, um, depending on the switching frequencies you need. But compared to standard depletion mode gallium nitrite hems, their switching frequencies would be much lower. One alternative is to look at the up and coming emo demo gallium nitrite technology. So this incorporates a slight modification based on existing demo GAN and the emo demo transistors can be integrated together on the same wafer for logic circuits. In the following examples we'll be using a emo demo gallium nitrite technology to show some switchers. The, the E mode is has a gate uh, length of 0.4 microns. Uh, the threshold voltage is somewhere around 1 to 1.5 volts. And hence, longer gate length for the demo transistor is needed in order to match the drive currents of the E mode. This is very similar to how what people do for CMOS designs as well, where you have uneven sized um, FETs for complementary gates. So we'll take a look at some emo demo logic circuitry. Here we have the direct coupled FET logic, and uh, which I'll denote as the DCFL, and then we'll, as well as the super buffer FET logic, which I will denote as the SBFL. The DCFL uh, has a low state voltage at around 0.5 volts, and the high state voltage goes all the way up to VDD. On the other hand, the SBFLs have a low, a low state voltage all the way down to 0 volts, but the high state voltage is about 4.5 volts. And one of the things with the super buffer uh, circuit is that it has lower DC consumption compared to the direct coupled FET logic. Now we'll take a look at the high side power switch driver. This uh, new uh, this new driver topology is a non-bootstrap topology used to improve the overall efficiency as well as help address the wide range of frequencies. It consists of an EMO-DEMO inverter with an additional D-mode device stacked on top. The benefit of having the E-mode uh, at the input of this driver is that it has safe operation since this is an enhancement mode device. Um, it 
Since the email device is larger, it also um, by having the output have be a demo device, it reduces the effect of the large output capacitance of the e-mode transistor. So this balances out the rise and fall time at the, of the output voltage. The EDD GAN switcher based, uh, topology uses the high side power switch driver that we discussed in the previous slide for the high side drive and for the low side drive we're using the super buffer. Um, this topology requires a negative supply to drive both the low side and the high side drivers. One of the disadvantages of this um, topology is that the duty cycle for the high side input control is doubled um, that of the high side switch duty cycle. However, the advantage is that at zero input, the high side and the low side switch are both off, so it's a safe start. On the figure on the top right corner is the picture of the mimic that was designed. Um, the inductor uh, out of the switcher those uh, was left to be a external component. Here we show a different topology for the GAN switcher. Um, for this version we call the EDP version. Um, the high side drive uses a super buffer that drives the high side driver uh, and then that then drives the high side uh, power FET and the low side power FET is driven by a super buffer to a enhancement mode depletion mode driver. The benefit of this of this topology is that the high side signal cycle is directly related to the high side switch control. However, the, the overall efficiency is slightly lower due to the additional pre-driver that's needed, which adds to the power consumption. The figure on the top right corner shows the mimic for this design. Once again, the inductor is a, left as an external component. Both of these mimics were fabricated and then tested. So here we show the DC-DC converter board, test board and setup. Uh, the waveforms were sampled at 8 giga samples per second. Um, we used an op amp to amplify the, the waveforms generated from the arbitrary waveform generator to drive the circuit. Um, and a catch dial at the output was used for deadband fail-safe operation. Two capacitors were added at the output to basically ensure the test capability over a wide range of loads, and so we'll be testing across um, loads varying from 12 to 150 ohms. And a off-the-shelf inductor was used for it as an external inductor. Um, shown on the picture on the right, on the left, we see the PCB board for the test circuit. The mimic is in the center, um, and if a zoomed in picture of the mimic, uh, wire bonded to the board is shown here. Um, the mimic was uh, soldered onto the board. The picture of the test setup is shown in the picture on the lower right. So we did a variety of measurements on different uh, at, with different duty cycles ranging from 20 to 80 um, percent, and then uh, as well as across different voltages: 5 volts, 10 volts, 20 volts, and 28 volts and across a variety of loads. So this gives us an idea of how the switcher would behave for as a 
uh, digital envelope amplifier. So each of these dots that you see corresponds to one combination of these variation. And we tested it with switching waveforms, uh, switching frequencies at 5 megahertz and 10 megahertz. Um, the output power was greater than 10 watts of uh, power. As you can see, the overall switcher efficiency was greater than um, 90%, and the overall efficiency remained at around 89% for both for both of them switching frequencies. So this is a very promising technology for digital envelope amplifiers. So, so here I show the results of the EDP switcher um, over the same variation. Um, as compared to the previous slides, and, um, each of those points showed the variation in duty cycle, V in, and um, the low resistance uh, for the switching frequencies of 5 megahertz and 10 megahertz. Um, so the overall, the switcher efficiency was greater than 93% for a 5 megahertz signal and greater than 89% for a 10 megahertz signal. When we compare the EDP switcher with the EDD switcher, we find that the EDP switcher had had less variation across the um, less spread across the very the data points. Uh, however, as we go to higher frequencies, uh, there's a bit more losses in the EDP switcher. Uh, but both of these switchers show a lot of promise as for use in a for use for digital envelope amplifiers, um, in terms of some of the continued work on digital envelope amplifiers, um, please stay tuned for that as we as we eventually get some permission to publish some more results. So, in summary, uh, we talked about. The design of envelope modulators and the different topologies that uh, pe uh, people have used uh, from a variety of hybrid uh, topologies. Um, the envelope tracking technology is a base bank technique which couples very well with digital distortion which is also a base bank technique. Um, being a base bank technique they are both um, center frequency independent, so the same modulator can be used at C-band, VHF, um, and also used all the way up at W-band, which we have done in the past as well. Um, when we couple that with a conventional class AB PA, uh, with some slight modifications and retuning, uh, we can increase the efficiency of a conventional class A BPA for high for signals with high PAPR. So today we covered also envelope tracking test beds and some of the differences between conventional test PA test beds and envelope tracking and that in ET we work with the amplitude and phase um, and not so much IQ. Um, being a polar uh, technique. Um, one of the biggest challenges for envelope tracking is the signal bandwidth um, and we've touched on how that could be addressed both through uh, some DSP techniques um, with slight with some circuit modification uh, using slow envelope as well as uh, in some of the up and coming work for digital envelope modulators. So with the slow envelope technique, we showed how efficiency can be increased from 20%, less than 20% to greater than 40%, a significant boost in performance. On the digital envelope amplifier, we showed that a open-loop multi-switcher 
BTPA uh, as a foundation uh, for these digital envelope amplifiers and show that linearization with pre-emphasis can be, can be realized to show uh, great, uh, great linearity. In addition, we also showed some of the uh, designs of the multi-switchers using state-of-the-art uh, emo demo gallium nitrite. And these switchers are, are great candidates for digital envelope amplifiers for high power integrated modulators. Um, so these switchers demonstrated greater than 90% efficiency for output powers ranging from 10 to 30 watts. So thank you very much for attending this presentation and being tolerant for any glitches that may have happened. These are some very strange times for all of us. So um, thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Johanna. So the floor is now uh, open uh, for questions and answers. Uh, request the audience to send any question they might have through the Q&A widget. And Johanna uh, is also online, and she'll be able to answer uh, questions that you might have regarding the envelope tracking power amplifiers. So, Joanna, while we wait uh, for the audience to send in their question, I actually had one thing that uh, kind of like a discussion, not really a direct question, is like um, the envelope cracking like uh, a few years back and even now like kind of took off as a very hot topic. And now I'm seeing that more and more uh, modulation standards are introducing wideband systems, right? For example, if we look at the 802.11 wireless LAN system, it started with like 10, I mean, like 20 megahertz bandwidth, and then it very quickly went to 40 megahertz. Then we had 802.11 AC, which had 80 megahertz. Then it went to 802.11 AX1, 60 megahertz. And now I'm hearing next generation 802.11 B standards going to 320 megahertz. How do you see the envelope cracking holding up its benefit as an efficiency enhancement technique? compared to like Doherty or other other techniques as the system bandwidth increases? So Johanna, you can use your mic and then hopefully, uh, if you are connected with the phone, you can directly say over the phone or, yeah, you don't type in the answers, just, just I think they just say directly and the audience should be able to hear you. Uh, we are unable to hear you, Hello? Johanna. Yes, Can you yes. hear me? Yes, Johanna, yes. All right, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, all right, sorry. I guess uh, my, I had to unmute it, in the, not from just the presentation, but from the computer as well. So, um, Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you, Johanna. Um, someone asked me to speak up, so. All right, um, so... Um, so you were asking what would be, uh, as a discussion point, um, what I see envelope tracking in terms of as systems ask, look for wider and wider bandwidth, right? So sure. um, there's definitely, so in analog modulators, as we saw today, there's, um, there's certainly a limitation in terms of um, to think one of the wider, widest bandwidths we, we were able to get to on, on in uh, using analog, analog modulators are these um, are a hundred it's a hundred megahertz signal, um, but that's uh, sort of a special case there. I think some of the more uh, um, I guess manufacturable, uh, commercializable um, to, uh, techniques uh, brings us somewhere closer to about forty megahertz, somewhere sixty megahertz. Um, mm -hmm. signal back. Um, if you're doing multi-carrier, um, 
then you can do certain techniques like the slow envelope. Um, and that's that's basically, so between the slow envelope and the digital envelope, the uh, envelope amplifier, that's sort of the two techniques that we're looking at to increase it beyond that to um, that 100 megahertz. So there's a lot of work um, to be aiming towards a 200 megahertz envelope, a 200 megahertz signal bandwidth um, envelope amplifier. So that's, in essence, uh, the rule of thumb is about three to five times that of the of a signal bandwidth. Right. So you're looking at something like a six to thousand, uh, one gigahertz modulator. Um, so the digital envelope amplifier is one of the ways we see things going mm -hmm. to accommodate that need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess, yeah, definitely I do see the push trying to go towards higher bandwidth. But yeah, I mean, I think the challenge still remains, like, as to do how to do very wide band systems. As you said, like, slow envelopes, like, digitally reducing the bandwidth of the envelopes, it's, the signal is definitely one of the paths mm, to yeah, go there. And absolutely, absolutely. And uh, if you're looking at some of the millimeter wave systems, they're looking at one gigahertz of bandwidth, right? Correct. So yeah, that's yeah, simply, I think, so there, yeah. there will be a home for envelope tracking. It's just not a solution for everything out there. Correct, yeah, that, 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 that's correct, right? Yeah, I mean, it may not be applicable to all types of systems, but yeah, I think there definitely will be a home for different systems. Thank you so much, Johanna. Thank so you. So if audience, if any of you have any questions for Johanna, please use the Q&A widget to send your questions and I'll be able to read it uh, aloud, and uh, you can have your questions answered by Diana. Well, it seems that there are no further questions for the audience. So thank you so much, Johanna. Let's take this opportunity to thank our speakers all once again. And thank you so much, Johanna, for your exciting presentation.